thank you, Neil, for that introduction, and welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar. Um, I hope you're sitting comfortably. So, without further ado, I'll begin. Um, so, amongst the small islands and inlets of Clue Bay, along islands remote and wild northwest coast, a series of oared galleys could be seen slipping out into open water, making their way towards an unsuspecting trading vessel bound perhaps out of Galway or Cork. Orders for the ships to increase their speed were being shouted above the wind and the waves. But if you observe more closely, you would notice that this was no ordinary captain, but the fiery and fabled Granuel, or Grace O'Malley, Ireland's 16th century pirate queen. One English governor, Sir Henry Sidney, described her as a notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland, and she is celebrated in song and verse down the centuries, with one ballad proclaiming that no warlike chief or Viking e'er had bolder heart than she. Yet it turns out that this notorious woman, as Sidney describes her, is largely lost in the pages of 16th century Irish history. Her life and career, which could have come out of the pages of a novel, was remarkable and unique and considered almost alien by the norms of 16th century Irish society. Tragically, and perhaps for this reason, the authors of contemporary Irish annals and accounts barely mention her at all. My interest in Grace O'Malley personally began in reading a passing reference to her in a volume on the history of piracy. Um, however brief a summary, um, I was intrigued by her life and also the fact that she actually met Queen Elizabeth I. And I was really uh, intrigued as to whether we actually had any material at the archives relating to her. And the answer to that was yes, we do. Um, unfortunately, Grace is thus not completely lost to history. Um, and the impression she certainly made on the English administration in Ireland, right up until Queen Elizabeth I herself, uh, features prominently in the records of state papers Ireland at the National Archives. So therefore, I hope to explore this neglected tale of the life of such a noteworthy uh, 16th century pirate, captain, clan chief, and femme fatale against the backdrop of Ireland under the Tudor monarchs, a significant chapter in Ireland's history. So just to give you an idea about what I'm going to talk about, um, first of all, I'm just going to talk about Grace, um, known in Irish as Grania, but I'll refer to her as Grace, um, just for clarity. Um, so looking at Grace's personal uh, life and the background of growing up in a Gaelic clan society, um, um, I will then move on to just speaking a bit about Ireland under the Tudor monarchs, and so the background uh, of Tudor Island, into which Grace was um, grew up and lived. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll move on to Grace's life, uh, both her early life, her marriages, and career as a pirate, and then later on when she comes into contact far, far more with the English administration in Ireland, and then her meeting with Queen Elizabeth I as well. So I'll discuss that in section four. And finally, I'll round off by talking talking about a bit, bit about her legacy, and to, and conclude. So the document you see here is perhaps one of the, the most important documents we have associated with Grace. Um, so what it is, is the answers that Grace gave to a series of 18 questions that Elizabeth sent her uh, in July of 1593. Um, so what Grace had done is sent in a petition to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth, um, like us I suppose, uh, was intrigued to find out more about her petitioner. So this is the, the list of questions that Elizabeth sent. And like Elizabeth, we would perhaps ask Grace, in fi trying to find out a bit more about her, um, her, Elizabeth's first question, who was her father and mother? So looking at Grace's answer, we find, we find the following. So her father, um, she says, was called Dodara O'Malley. Um, so Dodara means um, black oak in Gaelic. Um, his actual first name was Owen, um, and it says he was sometime chieftain of the country called Upper Ul O'Malley. So Ul is um, the Gaelic term for territory, um, and it says that it's now called um, called by uh, the Barony of Murrisk. And then she describes her mother. Her mother was called Mar Margaret Nimaley, um, daughter of Connor O'Malley, um, 
of the same country and family. So Margaret was um, daughter of a, a, a chieftain of a different set or territory um, of the Amalis, um, but of um, similar, um, similar ancestry. So the lands of her father, um, which was uh, the barony of Murisk, uh, situated on the southern shores of Clue Bay, um, uh, was part of, formed part of the coast of uh, modern-day County Mayo, as you can see here. It was around Clue Bay that the O'Malley clan was established and, and was one of the only clans in Ireland with an established maritime tradition. Um, so they were engaged as traders, pirates, or even hired as mercenaries. Um, and you can see here, just to highlight, um, so there's Murisk, um, and here is the principal seat of the O'Malley clan in modern-day Westport. Just here is um, Clue Bay itself, and I've highlighted Clare, Clare Island here, which we'll come on to later, which came to be associated with Grace. Um, later in her life. So you can see here a picture of uh, the islands and inlets around Clue Bay. Uh, this is a, a view from Crow Patrick um, on the southern shore of Clue Bay. And you can see that these small islands and um, inlets provide a perfect cover to conceal ships um, um, which with which they could um, one could easily intercept merchant vessels just coming which had to travel across the mouth of the bay, um, ships could easily intercept these um, undetected. So it was ideal for members of the O'Malley clan to, um, to to sail their ships out to sea in search of um, in search of uh, vulnerable merchant ships. So just to say a word on um, um, the O'Malley's, just beside the kind of common um, uh, common sources of income for Irish chieftains and clans, the O'Malley's had the unique um, source of income from that came from the sea, so either through trade or piracy or through selling produce that came from the sea, such as oysters, clams, herrings and other goods. Um, talking a bit more about the wider Gaelic society in which Grace grew up, um, it can be described as a corporate entity, so members of a particular clan were, an ex were less an extended family and far more a body uh, that shared a common affinity of, of, of an ancestor, a shared ancestor, basically. Um, a clan chief such as Grace's father would not have been um, would not have inherited his title, but uh, would have been elected to it. Um, it must be said also that land was not held indefinitely by a landed class as it was in England, um, but individuals would hold land for a limited period and then it would be redistributed amongst individual co heirs. So because of this, inter and intra clan politics were, were vulnerable to disruption and violent feuding. Furthermore, the great majority of the Gaelic population were also landless and therefore dependent on their lord, the lord they served. Gaelic custom, custom and attitudes towards women were also in many ways more discriminatory than they were in England. So women couldn't, for example, inherit um, their husband's property if they died. Uh, this is something Grace would particularly have uh, problems with later in her life, and one of the principal reasons why she actually petitions Elizabeth. But we'll talk a bit more about that later. Women in general would have been expected to maintain the household, and Grace would have been expected to learn household tasks such as growing, uh, uh, such as baking, spinning, weaving, preparation of meals or social visits. Um, even growing up, I think Grace was not prepared to abide by these deep-seated conven conventions. Uh, interestingly, her name, Gráinuel, it, uh, is thought to be um, an amalgamation of uh, Gráinne, that's Grace, and Mal, which is, uh, means bald, so Grace the bald, and this was after a, a story that she cut her hair short in the fashion of a boy uh, in order that she may go with her father to sea, um, in defiance of both her parents who said that it was not in the cust custom manner of a lady to um, share the life of a, a, a at sea, amusingly. 
And just to add here that you've got, um, yeah, you've got this. This is from a map uh, of the early 17th century, uh, just giving you an idea of what the kind of clothes that would have been worn at the time by both Irish gentlemen and women and those lower down the social spectrum in Gaelic Ireland. Um, so from an English perspective, this, this is a, a, an assessment of Ireland. This is just the front page of an assessment of Ireland produced for Henry VIII in 1515. Um, it gives you an idea of um, how the English saw Ireland at the time and how it's described. So what you have here is uh, the individual who, who assesses um, and um, basically says that Ireland is split up into more, more than 60 countries called regions. Um, and if we see here, I'll just highlight. So where it's, it says, where reigneth more than 60 chiefs, captains, whereof some call of themselves king, some king pairs in their language, some princes, some dukes, some archdukes that liveth only by the sword and obeyeth to no other temporal person, but only to himself that is strong. And every of the said captains maketh war and peace for, for himself and holdeth by a sword and hath imperial jurisdiction with his realm, within his realm, I should say, and obeyeth to no other person, English nay Irish, except only to such persons as may be subdue him by the sword. So just to give you background then, up until that point, um, Ireland had been in the Middle Ages colonised, um, well I should say in the High Middle Ages, by Anglo-Norman settlers. And the, the kings of England had exercised rulership over the areas of settlement and theoretically over the whole of Ireland. Um, Anglo-Norman settlement though tended to be uh, confined to the lower area, lowland areas of Munster and Leinster, um, where you had better quality of uh, fertile land, um, anything really above the 400 metre contour line tended to be um, still the province of native Gaelic clans. Uh, the same has to be said for lowland boggy areas and you can see just on the map here, uh, this is a map of jo uh, by John Go, um, cartographer, you can see um, in the south and the east there's a lot more geographical features that, that have been put on the map as well as place names um, and it's almost an indication of the um, at the time the extent of English um, rulership as it were in Ireland and you can see the shaded area is still very much an area where English authority was still limited um, so I mean just to, just to say that by Henry VIII's reign, reign uh, English power had in Ireland dwindled, especially ro royal power, I should say. And um, Henry wanted to remedy this, so he began a series of uh, political and legal reforms that were continued by his successors. Um, and this included appointing English administrators to uh, positions of government as opposed to local Irish lords. Uh, it also involved appointing local English governors, um, so um, presidents of provinces such as Connaught and Munster, Munster sorry. Um, uh, also it involved introducing things like English common law and uh, appointing officials um, such as judicial officials to areas so trying to in other words trying to attempt a strengthening of central royal authority in Ireland and also attempt a root and branch transformation of the disparate English and Gaelic areas under a unified model of English law, custom and rule. Um, so John Goh's map seems to, tends to highlight this growing area of English influence and it's one of the first, first or earliest maps to where Ireland's depicted on an east-west axis rather than north to south, uh, which is interesting. So. And this is just an example of um, uh, of he Henry um, trying to strengthen royal authority in his own reign by naming himself King of Ireland. Um, this is a letter from the, uh, the Council and Lord Deputy of Ireland to the King, just advising him to assume the title of uh, King of Ireland. Um, up until then, English kings had styled themselves Lords of Ireland. Um, since the reign of King John, King John had been granted the Lordship of Ireland, and ever since it had been, uh, they'd been known as Lords of Ireland. So. It was an attempt to 
strengthen the credibility of the English monarchy. So this is the background in which Grace grew up and, and lived. Um, so to talk a bit about um, Grace in her adult life, we, we should start perhaps by asking another question that Elizabeth did, uh, which was basically, who was her first husband? Um, and for answer, um, Grace was wedded to the son of a chieftain of the neighbouring O'Flaherty clan in 1546, um, so that was a year before Henry VIII died. So her husband was uh, Donal Ann Cougar O'Flaherty, that's um, Donal, um, of, Donal of the Wars, um, that it, um, O'Flaherty. Basically, he was, his nickname came from his prowess in battle. Um, so he was um, son of a O'Flaherty chieftain in the Sept of Connemara in modern-day County Galway. And Grace had three children by him, Margaret, Moore, and Owen. And it seems to be at this time that Grace starts her career as a pirate. Um, and so from her base in Bun Owen Castle, which you can see here, um, which you can see here, uh, this is uh, uh, situated on the coast of uh, modern-day County Galway, uh, or at the time Eo Connaught, uh, Western Connaught, that is. Uh, what Grace would do is, with several galleys belonging to her husband, she would um, uh, um, sneak out into the open sea and um, ply her trade along the coasts around uh, Galway Bay and, uh, and further north and south. Um, her galleys would, were quite um, adept at intercepting um, merchant vessels. Um, so galleys were oared ships. Um, um, which provided additional speed as well as sails. So they had sails and oars, so they could easily intercept more slower and uh, wider merchant vessels. So Grace would, um, Grace and her, their crews would intercept merchant vessels. Um, her crews would board the vessel and wait for her orders to plunder the ship. Um, if the captain of that ship was wise, he would negotiate a ransom with Grace. Um, otherwise, everything he would own on that ship, including probably the ship itself, would be plundered. Her ships would then retreat into the safety and seclusion of Bun Owen um, before any opposition could be raised against her. And Bun Owen, interestingly, is, was a really good place to actually conduct raids from because of the, um, the difficult currents and the, uh, the, the tidal currents, as I should say. Um, any ship trying to follow would struggle, I think, unless they knew the waters. So it was ideal, and the inlet was also, also was hidden uh, in part from the sea. So it was an ideal base for, from which Grace could ply her trade. So one of Grace's famous epithets is the Dark Lady of Duna. Um, she was known by this name for, um, from a tale whereby a boat was wrecked on the shores of Ahill Island, that is this island here. Um, it, it could tell most of the crew were dead, except for uh, she came across one crewman who was almost dead, but um, um, but was still alive. Uh, she brought him back to Clue Bay and nursed him back to health. And in the process, she and him became lovers. Um, and it was this love that was um, tragically cut short by uh, his murder at the hands of a na neighbouring clansman, the McMahons. Um, so in revenge, Grace goes after them. She attacks their ships, uh, kills every single person involved in the in in the raid um, that killed her lover, and not only that, she goes off after the um, McMahons in their stronghold at Duna and takes the castle, which you can just see here. So in mid in the mid 1560s, um, her husband Donal uh, was sadly killed. Uh, this was in a long-standing territorial feud with the, the neighbouring Joyce clan. Um, so he was killed in an ambush in 1565. Um, Grace successfully defends uh, one of the castles that her late husband had taken, which was attacked by her murderers, um, but decided, I think for safety's sake, to relocate her household and uh, 200 men that had um, served alongside her husband to her family, um, family stronghold uh, on the island of Clare, which you can see here. It's in um, Clue Bay, or just on the edge, I should say, of Clue Bay. 
Um, and it was not before, um, not before long that she married again. Um, in 1566, she marries uh, Richard and Iron Burke. That's Richard, Iron Richard Burke. Um, and he was a um, chief of the Burkes of Cara and Boris Hall on the northern side of Clew Bay. He was also the favourite to succeed to the McWilliam title, that is basically a chief, overall chief of the Mayo Burks, of Burks and Canton there. So Grace, um, within a year, she gives birth to a son by Richard, uh, who's named Theobald or Theobald. Um, he's known as Theobald Na Nalong, um, that's Theobald of the ships, um, on account of how he was actually born. Um, so he was he was born on the return journey of one of Grace's trading voyages, and the, the fable that surrounds his birth is even more extraordinary, probably one of my favourites. So the day after he's born, um, whilst Grace was on the return journey, um, the ship was attacked by Turkish corsairs. Uh, so during the fray, the Turks ap appeared to be gaining the upper hand. When Grace, hearing from the ship's captain who had announced that um, her crewmen were struggling and in danger of being defeated. She came up on deck in a fury, rebuking the crew for their failure in courage, and with a loaded blunderbuss, fired it into the ranks of Turkish assailants, shouting defiantly, take that from unconsecrated hands. This is said to have rallied her men, who fought back and defeated the pirates. Um, another great story um, is of allegedly Grace invoking the, uh, uh, the Gaelic rite of one year certain um, on her husband. This was a kind of rudimentary divorce whereby either party could withdraw from the marriage alliance within one year. So she allegedly she barred the gates of, of the Burke stronghold of Rockley, which you can see there in the slide. And she told her husband, who was returning from a, a hunting trip, uh, basically that I dismiss you. Um, I don't think this is a, a tale founded on uh, reality, um, but it certainly uh, sheds light on Grace's character as a fiercely independent woman who was at this stage respected as a leader within her own right. Um, also, English records seem to disprove this legend as well, confirming that she had continued to be associated with her husband, Richard, right up until his death in April 1583. So in a letter uh, written 15 months before Richard's death, um, an old English official, that is a, an official um, of a family um, descended from an Anglo-Norman settler, um, but who were Catholic, so did, um, shall we say, um, des uh, described as old English rather than new Protestant English. Um, so an old English official by the name of Theobald Dillon relates what happened when he went um, to collect rents off of um, from the Burks um, in, in the territory. So he says, I went there hence towards the place where McWilliam, that is Richard Burke, was, um, who met me with his wife, Grania and me Mailey. Um, so you can see here that um, he spelt uh, Grace's surname slightly wrong, so corrected it there. So with all their force, they and did swear that they would have my life for coming so far into their country especially his wife, would fight with me before she was half a mile near me. Um, so in other words, um, this was not the first time that Grace's fiery and warlike personality was noted by an English official, as we shall see, but it certainly shows that she, she and her husband were very much still together. So Grace makes her first appearance in English records uh, in 1576, um, so she encounters the Lord Deputy in the city of Galway, and it is in the Lord Deputy's personal account, um, written several years later, um, that he writes to the Secretary of State, Sir Francis Wolf Walsingham, about his encounter with Grace. So he says the following, There came to me also a most famous feminine sea captain called Grania Imali, and offered her service unto me wheresoever I would command her, with three galleys and two hundred fighting men, either in Ireland or Scotland. This, he says, was a notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland. Now it's interesting, I think, here to note that Grace is even offering his, her services to uh, an official, or I should say the Lord Deputy himself, 
um, the, the highest English official in Ireland. So it's probably for the reason that she felt it beneficial to her own personal um, position um, and also in terms of her interest in regional clan politics. Um, it was it's probably particularly um, true that her husband, as successor to the McWilliam ship, or at least favourite to be elected um, to that title, I think Grace was hoping perhaps to secure English support. Moreover, her, I think one of her fellow uh, clan chiefs, um, Melan O'Malley, had submitted to the Lord Deputy earlier in the year, so Grace may have been just following suit. Um, but either way, it does dispel the, the myth that Grace was continually opposed to in the English administration in Ireland. So, unfortunately for Grace, um, she would have a spell of difficulty um, shortly after she met Sydney. So, uh, in the summer of the following year, in 1577, Grace, in, in a raid on the territories of the Earl of Desmond in Munster, was captured and imprisoned by the Earl. Um, and later she was handed over to the English authorities and imprisoned in Dublin Castle. Um, in reporting this, the, the English official who was president of Munster, uh, that's Lord Justice Drury, uh, shares, shares the news of the capture of Grace, but he doesn't, in the letter, seem to hide his disdain for Grace's rebellious actions and behaviour. So as you can see here, he describes her as a woman that has impudently passed for a part of womanhood and been a great spoiler and chief commander and director of thieves and murderers at sea to spoil this province. I must add, though, that when he actually met her in November 1578, he, he gives her a backhanded compliment in passing, describing her, her steadfast courage. Um, so I think his opinion of her did, did soften, and he did release her shortly after in 1579. So when Grace is actually released from Dublin and goes back to, um, to County Mayo, to her, her lands of Clare, um, it seems to be a period whereby her and her husband tend to um, be loosely in cooperation with the English. So her husband agrees um, to help the English administration suppress a rebellion that's erupted in Munster and in Connacht, the uh, Desmond Rebellion as it's known, for which he actually originally helped to foment, uh, ironically. But um, he, just, he turns in, in, in support of the English um, and in return, the, Eng the idea being that the English will support his um, claim to the Mc McWilliam ship title. Um, so eventually he is um, uh, elected and he's even knighted in 1581. Um, unfortunately for Grace though, she was to be widowed a second time in April 1583 when her husband dies. Um, and what was doubly difficult is that she was to encounter the new governor of Connaught, who was not like um, the, the present governor, Sir Nicholas Malby, but was a lot more ruthless. And indeed can be described as perhaps uh, the most determined uh, enemy that Grace would encounter. Um, so this was the new governor, Sir Richard Bingham, appointed in 1584. Bingham was a hardened military veteran who had fought in several campaigns in Scotland, France and Ireland, um, as well as the Netherlands and against the Turks. So I, said, I mentioned that he fought in Ireland. He, he, was, he helped to suppress the, the Desmond Rebellion in, in the late 70s, 1570s. Um, but it was his ruthlessness and his tenacity uh, in suppressing any Gaelic opposition uh, to the imposing of English rule in Connaught that would later earn him the title as the greatest monster of all the English that were then in Ireland. Uh, he, he was un, unpopular for this reason, but certainly um, he effectively um, he would effectively not have a quiet um, a quiet um, period of governorship. So um, this is um, a document that caused much of the resentment and eventual rebellion in Ireland. Uh, sorry, in Connacht, I should I should say. Uh, so this was called the Composition of Connaught, which was introduced in 1585. Um, this was basically a survey um, we, uh, of the lands in the province, and 
it imposed a fixed yearly rent um, which was designed to um, get rid of an unpopular custom amongst both the Irish chiefs and the English administration of quartering both troops and lands on their tenants. Uh, so it's very unpopular. So it was not. It was actually meant to be uh, um, a, their tenants. Uh, so it's very unpopular. So it was not. It was actually meant to be uh, um, a good thing. Um, unfortunately, it did entail uh, Gaelic chiefs also surrendering their own rights and customs under Gaelic uh, law that they were entitled to. Um, moreover, it also in it also meant that. Um, they had to attend military hostings in the province. Um, for Grace's in-laws, the Burks of, of Mayo, it meant also the abolition of the McWilliam ship, which was just a step too far. So in the following year, a rebellion erupted in the province, and unfortunately for Grace, she would not escape or be immune from either the effects of the composition um, or from Bingham's reprisals. So just to, just to add... That if you can see here the, the list of names of chiefs um, who initially signed up to the composition, um, and Grace's is, Grace is not among, among them, interestingly, um, as you can see there. So, in, in her answers to Queen Elizabeth, uh, several years later, she describes the, the unjust treatment she received at the hands of Bingham, and also, sadly, the, the murder of her son as well. So, this was in response to. Um, qu uh, question 11 um, that you can see here where Elizabeth asks her how she had had maintenance and living since her last husband's death and for answer Grace <coughs> describes an episode in 1586 where um, she's apprehended by Bingham that is um, and, and almost killed um, so she says that Captain John Bingham that's Sir Richard Bingham's brother um, they apprehended her, tied her in a, tied in a rope. Um, both she and her followers at that instant were spoiled of their cattle and, and of all that ever they had besides the same, and brought to Sir Richard, who caused a new pair of gallows to be made for her last funeral, where she thought to end her days. It's, I mean, it, it was fortunate for Grace she would have been executed had it not been for the quick thinking of her, of, um, her son-in-law, um, Richard Burke, known as the Devil's Hook. So Richard Burke was married to her daughter, Margaret, and uh, he offered his son in pledge and as hostage for Grace's release and good behaviour. So it's just just as well for Grace. Um, otherwise, she would have, her life would have been cut short. So here's, here's another famous document that we can see. This is a petition that Grace sent to Elizabeth in 1593. Um, by this period, Point in time, Grace uh, had sadly, um, her circumstances, I should say, had sadly deteriorated uh, to, to quite a considerable degree. Um, she had been starved of the traditional means by which she could maintain herself. So her cattle herds had been seized, uh, either by Bingham or by um, rival clans. Um, her, Bingham had also successfully clipped her wings at sea, uh, depriving her of many of her ships and confining her freedom of movement. Um, so he had several patrol vessels um, basically ensuring that she, she and other uh, um, pirates or the, well, clans didn't um, carry out any illegal acts at sea. Um, her lands as well had been devastated by the rebellions in the late 1580s um, in the County Mayo. Um, and this desperate situation was also exacerbated by the fact that her sons were depriving her of what she was entitled to from her late husband's property. So that was a third um, of, of his lands, or at least the, the income from those lands, for her maintenance. So just to look at a little, um, a few things within the petition that are quite interesting. So you can see here, um, Grace styles herself your loyal and faithful subject, Gwanyan Nimali of Connaught which I'm sure was something that Grace uh, applied to herself quite loosely and liberally. Um, but it is interesting that she describes herself as that. Um, further down, she uh, I've just highlighted here as well that she asks Elizabeth to also uh, accept the surrender of her, of 
her son's lands to her and also that should they be recognized as, le as le legitimate heirs to her late husband's territory. And finally, perhaps most amusing of all, uh, you can see here the last, the last quote I've highlighted here is where she asks for permission in her life to invade all the Queen's enemies, uh, both on sea and land, um, uh, basically wheresoever they may be, without interruption of any person or persons whatsoever. So what this was is Grace's uh, underhand way of perhaps get, of getting royal backing for the restoration of her ships and the ability to operate uh, along the island's west coast without interference from Bingham, basically. So it was quite an underhand way of actually um, being, at, being able to restore a way of life that she was used to. Um, the petition was actually quite carefully worded um, and the reason for this was uh, because um, I think Grace didn't want to be, appear too antagonistic at this stage. So Bingham is not mentioned, his successes are not mentioned until Grace provides her answers. I think Grace didn't want to um, discourage Elizabeth from um, actually helping her by appearing antagonistic towards the um, administration in Connaught. So she doesn't mention that she um, is very tactful. So Bingham gets word of, of what she's up to. Um, Grace, is, Grace has um, now intended to come to London in person. So she, uh, Elizabeth writes her questions to Grace. Grace answers, but by this stage, the stakes have been raised. So um, unfortunately, her son Tibbot has been now apprehended, and so uh, Grace is keen to come to London to plead for him in person. Um, Bingham, as I said, gets word of this and is really not happy. Um, and he, he writes on no less than three occasions to um, to London, uh, imploring them not to receive such a traitoress in their midst. Um, and you can see here his quote, um, the quote from one of his letters. He doesn't hold back how venomous uh, in terms of his contempt for Grace. Um, so he, she, he says that she's a notable traitoress and nurse to all rebellions in the province for this 30 or 40 years past and her children being the only ringleaders of all mischief of their time. But it's interesting, you, um, he gets a gentle reproach from um, the Privy Council who write to him in response to one of his letters. And you've got a picture of William Cecil, Lord Burley there, um, who was one of the members of the Privy Council and uh, basically says that there's no, they have no cause to think that, or to, to see that she's a traitor or, of Her Majesty or the state, but there's no cause that they've found. Um, Bingham must have been incredibly frustrated, but he he's um, overruled and Grace successfully gets her audience with the Queen in early September 1593, and this was at Greenwich Castle. And here's a, a later impression, uh, 18th century impression of, of the meeting. Um, so I can imagine that both the Queen and um, the Queen of England, I should say, and Grace must have been curious to meet each other, uh, particularly as both were uh, women in positions of leadership and power, uh, contrary to the conventions of 16th century society. They must have seen at least or identified something of themselves in the other. Um, unfortunately, there is no re record of the meeting. So just uh, I think it's worth turning to um, perhaps some of the song and verse to get a bit of an embellished idea of the experience. So I've picked um, some, ver um, some extracts from uh, verses in the poem Gronuel, and it, it, describes, um, it, it describes the actual um, meeting between them. Um, but I'll start with um, um, just a few lines before where Grace enters the, um, Grace enters the presence of Elizabeth in court. So it says, though gentle dames their tittering scarce repressed, noting her garments as she passed them by. None laughed again who met that stern and flashing eye. In the wild grandeur of main erect and high, before the qu English queen she dauntless stood. Each looked with curious gaze upon the other's face and felt they stand before a spirit like their own. 
So um, it's interesting how the, the meeting would have progressed because Grace could speak no English and Elizabeth could speak no Gaelic. So um, what probably happened, I don't, I don't think there was an interpreter, I think what probably happened is that both women spoke in Latin um, together, which um, uh, both, of whom, both of which were well versed in Latin. So um, it was the only way they could converse. Um, it seems as well that after the meeting, um, the um, Pirate Queen of Ireland had made a favourable impression on um, her English counterpart, Queen of England, um, as, as Elizabeth granted Grace all the requests, which included pardon for her brother, um, as well as the requests that she'd made in the petition. So um, this is seen in a letter to Sir Richard Bingham, which Elizabeth writes on the 6th of September, 1593. Um, and you can see extracts from that letter here. Um, unfortunately, this letter is not in the state paper records, uh, in the original records, but it's held at um, uh, Hatfield House uh, in Hertfordshire. Um, but I've added, I've put in the quotes here, and you can see here uh, Elizabeth's pity for Grace um, coming through in, in the actual, that she really did feel sorry for her. Um, Grace was 63 at the time of meeting Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was about the same age. So again, it's I think she identified something of herself in Grace, um, certainly as a woman. Um, I think also, though the poets would have us believe that Grace was defiant to the last during her meeting with Elizabeth, it is likely that she endorsed a more pragmatic approach. Um, so in Elizabeth's letter, and I haven't added it in the quotes here, but Elizabeth says that Grace showeth herself dutiful, and upon her petition being granted, she, that is Grace, departeth with great thankfulness and with many more earnest promises that she will, as long as she lives, continue a dutiful subject. So it indicates, uh, I think at least outwardly, that Grace was willing to submit and uh, humble herself, at least in the, in the sight of Elizabeth. Um, uh, for the time being as well to English authority. Um, um, yeah, and you can certainly hear Bingham scoffing at uh, um, the contents of the letter, um, but he does, he does actually relent, and in a, he, in a letter he writes to Lord Burley a few months later in November, he says, um, he confirms basically that he, he has granted maintenance to Grace, her sons and brother too, um, and Grace's brother is uh, released, um, and uh, sorry, Grace's son is released, I should say, and Grace's brother is pardoned. So Grace does get what she wants, but unfortunately, Bingham uh, reneges on his on his part of the bargain, um, and continues to thwart Grace's attempts to revive her maritime activities. So he quarters troops on her land, and he he watches her movements. He sends patrol ships round to. Um, to Clue Bay, so he, he stops her from reviving her career as a, as a pirate. Um, Grace is so desperate that she actually turns to Elizabeth again two years later in 1595, and she even enlists the help of Elizabeth's cousin, Thomas Butler, who is the Earl of Ormond. Um, sadly, though, this time around, her pleas fall on deaf ears, so there's no response that, um, to, her letter, to her petitions. Um, and I don't think, I think Elizabeth, though, is um, more concerned about the state of Ireland and is preoccupied with a major rebellion at the time. So, uh, unfortunately, Grace's um, desperate cries are not heard. So, Elizabeth was trying to deal with an, a, a war that had broken out, uh, which lasted nine years. So it's known as the Nine Years' War um, and orchestrated by the Earl of Tyrone. But unfortunately for Grace, um, uh, she, is, uh, she is not actually. Um, uh, um, she's not received or responded to, um, and she seems to drift from the pages of history. So we know little of the remainder of her life um, until she was uh, um, until she died in uh, it's 1603, um, uh, which is um, a real shame. But um, interestingly, her legacy was to be a, an enduring one. So just to round up. Um, So Grace was not only a skilled leader and sea captain, but also an adroit player of uh, local and regional politics, manoeuvring between support and antipathy 
for the English administration. So her reputation as a fiery and independent woman, as well as a pirate and clan leader, revealed in the comments made by several English officials found in the records of the state papers on whom she, uh, on whom she left a profound impression right up to the Queen of England herself. As one governor of Connaught put it, she considered herself no small lady. Um, as you can see as well from the slide, oh, sorry, the slide here, um, in cartography too, her name is stamped with authority on some of the maps of the late 16th and early 17th century. So you can see her name uh, over the traditional territories of the O'Malley's. Um, so you've got Clue Bay here and um, Barony of Murisk along the southern shore. So you can see her name um, printed across. Um, so the legacy I think Grace left has in, not just um, was not just um, shortly um, was not just for shortly after her uh, death, but also um, endured down the centuries. And she became synonymous with resistance, whether by Jacobite supporters seeking to restore the Stuart monarchy in the, the 18th century, or by Irish patriots seeking independence from the, Brit from the British in the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, uh, Grace should also be celebrated as a pioneer um, of female leadership in 16th century Ireland, given the limitations that governed women's rights at the time in a conservative Gaelic society. So therefore, to conclude, um, Grace's life was forged and shaped by the sea and the wild shores of Western Mayo, and her life reflected a fierce devotion to independence as queen of the sea, queen of her clan, and queen of Mayo. Thus, in the final lines of Sir Samuel Ferguson's poem, Grace O'Malley, we must reflect, such was the life the lady chose, such choosing we commend her for. Thank you.